Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Classroom 2O Live. We're so glad you're here with us today. We are very excited about the show that we have for you today, and we're going to be focusing on Bully Binder, Memes, and Live Binders with two special guests, Donna Hatcher, the creator of Bully Binder, and Tina Schneider, co-founder of Live Binders. So at this point, I want to turn the microphone over to Tina, who's going to introduce Donna and tell us how they met and the beginning of this story. So Tina, take it away. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's great to be back at Classroom 2.0. It's been too long. Um, I'm very excited to introduce you to Donna Hatcher, who is a 6th, 7th, and 8th grade um, language arts writing enrichment teacher at Dakula Middle School in Gwinnett, Georgia. And I was fortunate enough to um, see a, a, an email from her when she first became a LiveBinder user, which was this year, or actually this school year. And she was asking me some basic questions and wanted to do some pretty cool stuff with live binders. And I was fortunate enough to see the bully binder concept um, from beginning to end. Well, I guess it's not really ending. It's going to keep going. But it's pretty exciting. Um, she really got me engaged with this concept of memes. I had seen memes before, but I had never really thought about it from a language writing perspective. And so, and of course, we all are familiar with um, the concept of bully, bullying. And so um, what she was doing with the kids and how the kids were really engaged really caught my attention. And I'm so glad that um, she was able to make the binder public and to share it with all of you and, and is here today to, to share it with us as well. So without further ado, Donna, I would love for you to um, share with us your journey in all of this and tell us what is a meme. Okay, thank you, Tina. Um, I really appreciate your introduction, and I uh, appreciate so much uh, being invited by Classroom 2.0 Live. Um, I want to welcome everyone here. Uh, my goal today is to um, show you my live binder uh, in the light that I can Hopefully you can walk away with something. That's um, we go to a lot of webinars and seminars and meetings, and um, we get lots of great information. Uh, it's just a matter of turning that into something that I can use into the classroom. So whether you're new at this or been around as long as I have, um, I hope I can provide something for you today. Um, okay, so on to our newbie question: What is a meme? Um, you probably already know what a meme is. You just don't know that you're a, you know what it is. Um, the term meme was uh, coined, I guess, and defined by Richard Dawkins in 1976, and it means an imitated thing. Um, I don't want to confuse this with uh, evolution or refinement of a physical characteristics like birds having certain beaks because of the and bills and beaks based on where they live and what they eat. Uh, a meme is a particular action that is either that is adopted, uh, a learning action that is uh, adopted by either the majority of the species or an entire species uh, that is enhances their their particular um, survival. The example that I give to my students that they seem to be able to connect with is how we as humans learn about something hot, learn about a hot stove. Um, we've all seen or heard about a, a child, someone young, touching something hot, getting burned, and uh, for those of you that it's ever happened to, it just takes that one time. And we learn that. And we see other people around um, a hot stove or something hot, and we know that it's hot and it will burn us and it will hurt us. Um, so there we, we have learned that behavior and we, it's copyable. So we've learned it and it has spread among us. 
and we engage in that, um, that behavior. Birds and beaks and a hot stove, what, what does any of this have to do with my bully binder? Well, for me to explain, the best way for me to explain this to you is kind of uh, what I call the cultural etymology. Um, it's where these definitions of terms from way back when have morphed into something else. And given our global uh, presence online uh, of our online activity, Sometimes these meanings, are based in logic, take on you know something surrealistic, uh, and it's one of those things where you get to the point where why ask why? So as you can see by my uh, screenshot here of the uh, of my bully binder, which is the assignments tab, and I have put up that yellow. Um, the two yellow arrows there that show you where uh, this is. That there are two hallmarks to memes. First, they are copyable or spreadable. Spreadable. We know that is going viral. And this art form has mass appeal. Uh, secondly, it's participatory, um, kind of like gangman style. Uh, everybody loved it. It went viral. But everybody also did it. They made their own videos from it. So that was the uh, how something goes from going viral to becoming a meme. Why memes? Why bullying? Um, this got started, uh, and I need to probably back up a little bit uh, in my career. When I first started teaching uh, back in, um, uh, let's see, 1992, I had a classroom that looked like this. Of course, if you go back even a little bit further, you s we didn't have computers. I can remember when the only person who had a computer in the room was the teacher and wasn't too sure how to use that thing. What good is this going to do? Oh, yeah, they'll keep a grade book. Well now, um, you know, here is the regular classroom and got that one computer sitting way over there in the back. So, um, and now there was the advent of the, the computer labs where you could load up all your students, all your stuff, and you could trek off to the lab and you're trying to hurry up everybody to get there. So you can squeeze every teachable second out of the hour. And you're hoping that we're not going to get there too slow. But uh, for those of you who have ever tried to hurt up a group of eighth graders, well, you can imagine what that's like. <coughs> Excuse me. So in 2003, I, uh, uh, 2013, sorry, I get a new teaching assignment. And I go to this. Um, I figured you'd get a kick out of this. I could have left all those arrows off, but I thought it was much more dramatic. And I can tell you, when I walked into this room, if this doesn't make you take a deep breath and go, hmm, what am I going to do? Um, where am I going to go? What am I going to teach? And uh, this is, it, it's sink or swim time. I know enough about computers. I've been in the lab enough to know that, that um, if you don't have a specific set of, uh, of assignments or tasks that the students are going to do, um, this is going to be fun for about mm, 20 seconds. Uh, and then after that, uh, it's going to go downhill fast. It's going to get ugly fast. So I'm sitting there looking at this and go, I better get a plan. So let me uh, continue on with what it is that I'm supposed to do. So I, I'm thinking to myself at the end of last year, OK, I'm, this is going to be my new room. And what is it that I need to do? First, let me explain to you about my class. I'm a connections teacher, which you know people may associate that with band and PE and music and so forth, the, the elective type things. But here in Georgia, and I'm sure uh, everywhere else in a lot of places, especially in high school, these electives are becoming academic. 
and as in our particular school, you know, we're trying to train our students to understand that connections class is just not that break time. It is not time to go out and play kickball and and, and believe me, I'm not. Uh, um, those things are wonderful and uh, very educational. Um, especially here, the the PE teachers and such have uh, what we call SPG, certain learning um, t um, tools and stuff that they have to meet. But I have this academic class, and Common Core is here. Um, whether you agree with it or not, um, Common Core is here. And I did paste a link for those of you who don't know a lot about Common Core, not that we any of us really do yet, because it's going to take a while to roll this out. Um, what I do know is that it involves a, a tremendous amount of critical thinking. And for those of you who know anything about eighth, uh, correction, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, abstract thought uh, is just not their forte. Um, we're, we're still working on um, concrete thought with some of these uh, students. But I believe that uh, if we continue forth with this and you know teachers learn how to let students ex experience uh, concrete thought, and as we uh, go through the Common Core, uh, then this will be better for the students. So, as I'm searching around, I stumbled upon Ed Webb, and I saw there in the beginning that a lot of people had uh, chatted in and said that they, you know, were familiar with Ed Webb and Common Sense Media. All wonderful, wonderful sites. But um, I attended a webinar on bullying by Mr. Shannon Holden. Very smart man, and he uh, has put he's um, created an entire um, lesson, uh, an in entire program on bullying that many schools actually purchase, and it is a plan, a program that uh, teachers administrators, parents, and students can, where they can learn about bullying and also how to impact what it does to the school, in, in the schools and to the school systems. So I used, um, I, as watching this webinar, I thought, oh my gosh, this, this is content that my students need to hear. Every one of my students have some connection, whether they've been a bully, whether they've been bullied, or whether they've seen it. And the light bulb came on in that this is, this is it. This is my universal topic. It has that universality where everybody knows something about it. Well, I'm, you know, here we're still during during the summer. I'm still my brain is still working and mulling this over, and all of us mull over assignments, mull over theme units, whatever our lesson plans are going to be, over in our mind. Can you imagine if we got paid for how much we were thought about our lessons? I'd be a billionaire by now. But again, you know, I'm thinking about that computer lab, and I don't want to be the 21st century version of mutiny on the bounty when I don't have something. So bullying, what can I do? We're going to write essays about that? Uh, I don't think so. Well, I'm watching my kids deal with their iPhones, and they're watching television. They got their iPhone and their iPad out, and they got their earphones in, and how they can multitask with all this is beyond me. And my kids are laughing, and my son will show me something. Mom, look, oh, this describes me to a T. This happened to me yesterday. And I'm thinking he's going to show me a picture of himself. Next thing he shows me, this, what I come to find out, is a meme. And laugh some more. Mom, this is you. This describes you to a T. And I realized that they're showing me memes that I can connect to. And that's part of what makes it a meme. And then, let's see if I get to the right slide. Ah, 
the angels sing, you know, like my little angels and music, the harps playing in the heavens. Why not memes and why not bullying? It just is one of those aha moments, one of those um, uh, where you're thinking, oh my gosh, this is it. So I've had this epiphany. And then introducing, ta-da, the bully binder. And this is a screenshot of this, and I'm going to show you my binder uh, in just a moment. As a matter of fact, I think I'm going to pull that up now. Um, if we can, I'll go ahead and share. Um, let's see here. Let me get to my sharing. I'm going to go to my Chrome. And are we, let's see, I think I'm there. Let me make sure I'm here. Okay, great. We're seeing it now. Um, so here's my binder. And the first thing I'm going to show you here on the main tab is my welcome to educators here. And you can see that I have, there's my common sense media and uh, Georgia Department of Education that kind of shows you how we're making the leap from uh, Georgia performance standards to Common Core. And then I've got this, uh, this site will help you understand what Common Core is about. But this is just my introduction to you to let you know how this evolved and invites you to give me feedback. Uh, suggestions, ideas. I mean, we're all uh, kind of in this together. I do want to show you um, Shannon Holden's site. Uh, the man is just a well of information. and He is so dedicated to uh, getting that out to teachers. Uh, new, this new teacher help um, for those of us who have been around for 20 some odd years, there's some times that I, you know, I am a new teacher that day. So great, great uh, amount of information on here. And um, as I find new websites, especially that are helpful for situations like this, uh, I will add them to that. What I want to uh, point out to you here is the organization. And this organization has come about because it is student driven. You know, I'm organizing it one way and how they think might be another way. And so what I've done here is um, color coding it. And Tina will talk to you a little bit later about uh, color coding and, and what people do with that. Um, but I start introducing the explore bullying in my classroom. I'm starting to teach bullying. You know, yeah, they know about it, but do they know that there are criteria? There's aspects of it. So we, I, I want my students to learn this. And this again is uh, adapted from um, uh, Shannon's with permission, which again, I just can't thank him enough for giving me permission to use that. But uh, you can see up here at the top, I have just playing around uh, the flickety slappy tap, which my students really, you know, they go, oh, that's what we call it. Um, and then we have the victim, the bully, and the bystander. And what I do is I, I will have students, I will create a scavenger hunt, per se, to let the students get in there and not only learn about bullying and these different aspects of bullying, but they're also learning how to navigate the binder. They're also learning about the art of navigation. And with sixth graders, um, you know, for even those people down in elementary school, then um, learning how to navigate, you know, no, that's not one of my AKS, my academic skills that I'm required to, to teach. But if my students don't know how to use this tool, then I'm not doing them a service by just handing it over and say, here, go forth and do. Um, I also have connected uh, 
uh, websites that are specifically geared for their age group. And we do scavenger hunts through here because we've all seen a student get to a website and if the information they want is not saying, hey, Joe Schmo, here's the piece of information you want. They, they want it to just pop up in front of their screen. They don't realize that behind that screen is just a labyrinth of, of information. So the scavenger hunts also teach them how to navigate through these sites. And you can see that I have lots of websites up here that are sub-tabbed. And um, one that I do want to point out is Wellcast. Wellcast is just a wonderful, wonderful site that um, uh, targets bullying. And I've gotten um, their, their YouTube-based videos. And our particular system, the students can't access uh, YouTube. So I've gotten permission to uh, download those and convert them to WMV files so that I can send them out to the students. And they get a lot of information from there. So it also teaches them how to, you know, from home they can see this. You know, I have a lot of students who access my binder from home. So from home they can see this, but at school I have to um, upload the videos as a WMV file because of our firewall. The next thing I'd like to show you is the copyright information. Now this, this was a journey uh, of discovery for me. Um, when I talked about making my binder public and putting these items in here, that's where you know the copyright issue came to play. And I thought, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it right. And I wanted to model for my students what I had done so that they understand that, you know, copying and pasting a picture from Google is, there are laws about this. And the kids, they just, they don't look at that. It's just not part of their reality. So I contacted all of these companies and um, asked them for permission. And this would probably be my next big tip to you. It was for me. First off, not one single entity turned me down. And not only did they not turn me down, they were more than excited to, to grant me permission and to help me. What can we do to help you, you know, make this better? You're especially, and that's what drew me into Live Binders. Um, you know, I'd heard about it. Uh, actually in an EdWeb uh, webinar and I thought, you know, this is just all coming together perfectly. Let me figure out if I can do this and I come to one little snag um, and I thought, let me just email the help desk. And now I am a believer in the support and the help desk for every site I go visit because they want to help. They, they, they just love it. And Tina and Barbara were just so fantastic, so fan I, this couldn't be, have happened without them. And here uh, for my students, and I'm eventually going for next year going to make a, a lesson, so I'll be adding that, so uh, please stay tuned for that on um, copy, how to copyright or what is copyright and what are the laws that my students need to understand. I also have this in here, Google permission policies. And they're like, you have to, what do you mean permission from Google? I, they just thought it was their Easter basket and they could just take the stuff out of it whenever they wanted. Um, so I've added this in here and I will be updating that. But GCPS, Gwinnett County Public Schools, we also have databases that we are, we subscribe to. And we get, um, we have legal permission to use that. So you might want to check with your system to see what databases that you have and what you can use. But this was an incredible journey. The next section I have here is the reference section. Um, it's kind of my uh, be all, you know, this is what you need. 
like for example, they want to use a snipping tool. I have kids ask me questions, Miss Hatcher, how do I do this? Where do I get that? And I'm thinking, well, you've asked me and probably 10 other people are going to ask me that. Why don't I put it in my binder? So whenever a student would ask me anything of how to do, where to get it, what to do, this is where I put that. And they know that um, if they have asked a question before or my friend has the same question, hey, go to a reference section. It's in there. She put it in there. The key to that is, again, it's student driven. This is, this is their tool. Um, finally, we get to what is a mean. And when my students saw this, you know, they see these two memes right there and they go, oh, oh yeah, I know what a meme is. And it explains it. Probably not only to my students, but my parents use this resource now too. Because I have those kids who need the extra time and the extra help and their parents are really involved. What are you doing in Mrs. Hatcher's class? Oh, let me show you. She's got this binder. And, this, and the parents are reading this too. And so I've gotten permission to use this information. And from Mashable, uh, they had an infographic. So for those of you who want to kind of look at the evolution of a meme and how it came about, then you can uh, take a look at that. And what I have here up at the top are some sample memes. So I teach kids about bullying and then about these memes. And now I want them to be able to explain them. Do they get all of the intricate pieces of what a meme is? It's not just a picture. It's not just our uh, what the text is. It is the inferencing of all of this coming together and then connecting it to their own, their own lives. That's why not everybody has a meme that fits their personality. So I've put several in here, even some that I, uh, pictures that I found on our databases that they get. They understand this picture. And then um, one, let's see, here's one that I created. Um, and they, they understand that. And so we practice writing about this. Again, you know that this is my uh, a writing enrichment class. So their writing is, explain this to me. I want to see how you communicate to me if you understand what it is I need you to understand. Um, next, when we, once I, we get through this and I know that they understand what is a mean and can I explain a mean? So they have to prove to me that, yeah, oh, I get it, Miss Hatcher. Oh, yeah, what is it? Then I want them to start making memes. And you can see, in, in our school, they're not allowed to, to go onto Google unsupervised. Well, you know, when you've got 35 computers, that's not an easy task. And I can, we have software where I can sit at my computer and watch them. Uh, but the operative word there is sit at my computer. And I don't, I don't want to sit down. I want to be out there where all those arrows were. And I want to be with my students as I watch them discover what's going on in their binder and, and, and what kind of pictures that they're getting, what kind of imagery. So I've just made a collection of websites of, that I've already pre-selected that can, um, where they can get their uh, images from that will meet those copyright standards. Um, and another thing that's t a byproduct is that it's taught them that Google is not the only game in town. You know, they, they're starting to realize, wait a minute, I thought that was the only place you got pictures. Then we get to the um, assignments. And this is the part where I think uh, Tina and I spent a lot of time talking in that where it is also a resource tool for the, um, the students. And this is where it really helped me in my classroom is that I could post my assignments. The student, it, it was there. The students could see it at home. The parents could see it at home. If I needed a student, who, or if a student who didn't understand it, they could go back and see it. 
Um, and, and there it was. It wasn't something that I had to re-say over and over and over. They could understand it. Um, I would put resources in there for them that would help them with this assignment. And then we would get down to the assignment of they were required to create a meme that had the point of view of the bully, a point of view of a victim, and point of view of a bystander. Ms. Hatcher, I, I've never been a bully. I've never bullied anybody. Well, we've learned about that, and now you're going to apply what you know about bullies. Can you create imagery and text that come together to represent that point of view? And there is your critical thinking. That's, that's a lot of very, very deep thinking for you know, children who are cognitively right at the concrete level. But that's what Common Core is. And the only way that they're going to get through that is to just keep practicing it over and over and have that self-discovery and that experiential learning. Uh, and I think now, uh, before I show you student results, uh, we'll go back to my um, slide. Okay, and let's see. Let me move this out of the way. And uh, let's see. Can we see my next? Yes. Can we see my next slide? Yes. Okay. Why live binders? Um, safety and security. For those of you who. Um, have a lot of students on the computer at one time, or you have that one computer. You're doing 50 million other things, and you know, keeping your head up on a swivel, trying to figure out what the child on that back computer is doing. You know, you face some some legal issues there. Um, predetermined selections. While my planning. What it turns into is it translates for into the classroom. I don't, my, ch my student is not wasting time learning how to surf and learning how to navigate and learning how to find information and, you know, searching in, for the needle in the haystack. I've collected the needles and I have organized them for them. Bypasses common uh, search engines. Like I said, Google is not the only game in town. I, I love Google. I'm a Google queen. But we do, you know, based at our school, we have some requirements that the students have other resources. And the databases like Galileo, they have so much information that, that there's more than they can use in a lifetime. A buzzword that is just a, a an important hinge point in schools now, and I know in my own classroom as a connections teacher where I'm teaching all kinds of students at every learning level is differentiation. I, my binder allows these students to, who have lower abilities to, they become, and that, I guess that comes into my familiarity, is that they know that they're not afraid that Mrs. Hatcher is going to just dump me out into the World Wide Web and then I come back when I've collected all my stuff. No, she's got it here for me and this is not so scary anymore. Then I've got students who can really get in there and navigate those sites and the, it leads them to other places. The flexibility, you can see that I can organize it and I can organize it how my students need it. It's student driven, Ms. Hatcher. This would make a lot better sense if you put this over here. And I can move it, right? I can just, you know, hit edit and move it, tell them to refresh. There it is. And probably my most favorite part is fixing it on the fly. If I need to pop something, something in there that a student needs right away, click, 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 I'm there, have them refresh, and it's up for them in a matter of moments. Back to the familiarity. You know, it's like I equate it to walking through your bedroom in the dark. They, they know it. They are, they're not afraid. They can get there and get busy. And there's, there's no time wasted. 
Uh, it's innovative. I've got software. I've got hardware. I don't teach computers. I teach with computers. It, it's a tool that they need to understand. And probably the most important part to me is the LiveBinder support. They, I, I can't say enough. They will, they will help you at every turn. They, they, they will, li they listen to my suggestions. They help me understand my problems. Help me to find solutions to this is what I need for this student. This is what I want my student. They are as much as educators as I am. It is about getting to the student. And then finally, I want to go back one more time to my binder and tie this all up and show you what my, um, my the results are. And I'm going to go back and share. I'm going to click my, and we should be there. Let's see. All right, hopefully you're seeing that. And I got just a few moments left. And what I want to show you here are my student results. And hopefully we're seeing that now. Um, I've just made a few things for myself, but what I really want to show you is highlight what they've done. Okay, here is uh, a meme that a student created for a bully point of view. And over here is where they've written their explanation. And this is what they see. And we talked about facial expressions. We talked about body language. We talked about is your text matching the imagery there. And so you can I can see that my my student has thought this through. They get it. Another one. And and probably the most significant thing about this is that this child, the student is telling me, is speaking for those people, yeah, I've seen some bullying and I want to report it, but I'm afraid. And I'm teaching, I'm not teaching them, they're learning it. They, you know, I just put it out there, I'm, I'm just facilitating it. And they have figured this out on their own. And that's what makes it so exciting. Another one, um, again, here's uh, proof positive that the, that the students are seeing. Here is a character that has a look on his face. And we get it, but I'm prepared for his next attack. And they're putting what they think, what they've learned, what they know, and connecting it to imagery that they've searched for. That's a lot of thinking, a lot of thinking. Here's another one. Now I'm super emotional. Almost as if it's all as if I don't have to say anything. These memes stand alone. That this child's work stands by itself. Another bystander. It's how do I feel after I've seen it? I, I wish I could have done something. And this is speaking for those people who have felt this emotion. So here's another victim. But look how different the victims think, how they feel. So I gave him the wrong answers to the test. I'm going to get him back. I was just amazed at the variety of feelings that these students have. Notice the quote marks around kidding. Oh, I'm just kidding. And then finally, I didn't see anything. So um, I'm going to go back to my uh, slides, and I think that that will 
and what I have here, oh yes, um, I have this picture here. I, I thought it was great to represent. I, I just want, I want them to learn on their own. It's, I, it's, how do I teach critical thinking? So I'm going to let them go out there in the wild blue yonder, but uh, I've got my little training wheels here. And that's what Live Binders is for me and my students and what it's doing, how I feel about education and common core and critical thinking. And uh, actually, uh, I do have a Twitter account now. Um, I'm not real good at it yet, but I'm getting there. <laughs> but feel free to contact me anytime. Thank you very much. Donna, thank you for sharing with us your inspiring journey. That was excellent. And you know, I, I always learn something from these webinars, so I just want to share with you um, some thoughts I had while you were presenting. You know, it, it was really interesting that, you know, Donna, like all of us, goes to these webinars and you hear these great ideas and then when you want to come back and try to apply them to your life, how do you do that? In, in the case of Donna, you know, how is she going to take the webinar and the live binder, um, the bully webinar and the live binder webinar and, and bring that back to make it relevant for her classroom and, and her students? So, you know, sometimes your, your gut tells you to go in a certain direction and your mind tells you, well, you know, I don't have enough information or I've never done that before. And, and oftentimes, you know, we just have to jump in and do it. And, and the metaphor that we use is you know, jump in and you start swimming. And I would always wondered, you know, what, what does swimming mean? And, and it came to me that really swimming is asking questions. And I think that's really, Donna, what you did is you just... You, you, know, you got some information, you had a, a situation that you had to work with, you got some ideas, and you've never done it before. And you, you know, began with starting to ask me a few questions, and it, it led to more and more questions. And before you know it, here you are. So um, I got something out of it, and I really want to thank you for sharing that with all of us. So now it's my turn to share. And uh, Peggy has asked me to kind of give you an update on new features of Live Finders, but also through the survey we realized that there's many of you who haven't heard of Live Finders yet. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to go over the concept of Live Finders and then go into some new features and share with you some all you know different kinds of examples of binders that might help you um, get some ideas for your classroom. So basically, it's um, it's, you know, remember the paper document and, you know, you could just punch a few holes and get things organized and you could present a binder to people, make Xerox copies and everything would be in an order and have context. Well, now we're, you know, on the web. We've got Web 2.0 out there. We've got things that we're collecting, documents that we're creating like in Google Docs and Dropbox that we're saving. So how are we bringing all this material together? and putting context around it and organizing it like we used to do with paper. So that's kind of where Live Binders comes in. Um, it was inspired by teachers and it was really started out as a presentation tool for um, presenting all of this cool content like video and prezies, um, but in a way that was structured so that the students could then find it on their own um, after class and the teacher could then use the binder over and over again as, as the years progressed. So that's where um, dogs in the background, sorry about that, where Live Binders came from. So let me, I'm not sure how to move through the slides here. I've lost my interface. OK, so integration, thank you, Peggy, uh, integration tools. So uh, it's a way to get all of your content in one place. So we have a, a tab hierarchy, so you can put things in main tabs, and if you have other material that you want to put under a main tab, we also have sub tabs. And uh, just FYI, in the future, we're going to be providing a third level of tabs for our subscribers, and we're excited about that release, and hopefully I'll be able to share that with you in the future. So on the next slide here, um, Basically, this is what a binder looks like. Uh, you saw this with Donna's binder. You've got a top level of tabs that you can color. 
Um, so those are the main tabs. And inside those tabs, you can have a series of sub-tabs. And each tab or sub-tab can have content in them. So if you have a PDF you want to upload, a tab can um, if you can upload a tab or content into that PDF. If you have a website that you want to load into a tab, you can just add the website in there. You can see that this one has www.corestandards.org in this particular sub-tab. All right, so the next slide. Um, so tabs can be either on the top or they can be on the side. And this is an, I threw in the screenshot of, a, of um, a binder with tabs on the side. So you can see here in this Common Core binder that the teacher had made the main tab blue. Subtabs are in gray here. Let me get my pointer. Um, and then the brown tabs are other main tabs in this binder. And you can you know, upload content, but you can also type content in a tab page. So here she's kind of explained a little bit of what this binder is about. And then over at the top um, are these share menu options. So uh, this is the house here. It lets you go back to your binder account. The little flower here gets you back to featured binders. The plus sign here um, allows you to add a binder to a shelf. You can create shelves of binders. Um, you can also make a copy of a binder. And this is dependent on whether an author lets you copy their binder or not. And we have many teachers that will use binders as classroom templates. So they'll invite, they'll create a binder uh, as an outline, and then they'll have the students copy them. So that's an option that you can do here. And then um, this little share icon here is you can email binder links to people. Um, you can um, post them to Twitter, Facebook, Plurk, and you can send them in an email. And then this little eye here represents how you want to view a binder. So like I said, if, if a binder that you're looking at has a lot of tabs on the top, you can have it view in, um, in a side tab view. But you can also set a binder to default to side tabs as well. It's also a place. So once you start creating more than one binder, you probably want a place to organize them all. So we created the concept of a, of a shelf. And you can embed custom shelves on your website. So we've seen uh, librarians embed um, shelves of homework binders. So sh for example, at one school, this librarian has talked to all of the teachers in her school with different subjects. So she's collected all the resources that the students would need to do their art homework or their um, biology homework or their math assignment. So she's posted all these binders on her shelf. They're really easy to add and remove. And it's a great way to get the students to come to the website and find the resources that they need for their classroom. And as you can see here, you can add little binder covers. So these were actually from um, a webinar that we did a few years ago. These are different teachers that we had featured. And so we put their pictures on, on the binder cover here. So who uses live binders? Well, um, they're used by administrators who are trying to go paperless and adding all kinds of curriculum material into binders, sharing um, professional development material. Uh, I gave you the example of how librarians are using it. You've seen Donna's example where it's a, it's a resource binder for her students. We've had template binders. Students are now starting to use them for their e-portfolios. Um, We've got examples of them being used in computer labs um, where each tab is represented in each different computer for an assignment for the students. Um, parents are using it to put field trip documentation and newsletters. So there's all kinds of uses um, for, for live binders. All right, so let's get into some of the new features. So I. Um, we recently introduced a tool that lets you log into your Dropbox account. So if you've got um, PDFs, videos, files in your Dropbox account that you want to add the link to a binder, you can now just log in from the editor of a binder and just click on My Dropbox. But there um, have been some changes. And just last week, uh, Dropbox announced that with PDF files and uh, Word documents, any kind of document that could possibly have a hyperlink in it will now be um, automatically just downloaded to your desktop. So before, you used to be able to just open it up in a browser and view the document without having to download it. 
um, that policy has changed for security reasons, and so that's changed the way it views in a binder. So before you used to be able to just view the, the PDF in the binder tabs, now it just starts um, downloading it. So um, there are two things you can do. One is you can upload them to your Live Binders account. We provide about 100 megabytes of free storage. Um, if you know if you have been using Dropbox for a while and this is um, kind of an urgent thing, please send me support at um, support at livebinders.com and we will um, try to help you on getting more storage for your account. The other option you can do is we found out that box.net um, will still load in the binder without downloading. So if you have a box.net account or are thinking about making the switch, that would be another option as well. So um, as you're looking at this menu bar, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, I mentioned that you can upload files and you can add links, but there are other um, tools that we have here that will um, help you get other kinds of content in a binder, and one of them is Flickr. So for Creative Commons license of images that for decorating your binder cover or just adding context to your binder, you can search using search terms for Flickr. Um, YouTube links do not uh, display the video in the binder, but if you use our search tool, it will, or you can use the embed code. So let me just quickly go, I think that's my next slide, yep. So any media file, like a YouTube video, a school tube video, if you've got Prezi's or Quizlets, they all come with embed codes. So if you're having a hard time getting um, a media file to load in the binder, try, insert, try finding its embed code and inserting it um, in the tab with the embed code, and this is how you would do it here. And if you do find that there are some embed codes that aren't working, please send me email. Uh, again, at support at livebinders.com. Uh, somebody will answer your question, and sometimes it just takes a little tweak of the embed code to get it to work. There are some with JavaScript in there that, that is hard to get in, and we're actually working on those. A couple of them are Twitter, but getting a Twitter feed in a, a binder tab, we're still working on. That one's a little complicated code, and I think, uh, and maybe Facebook, but I'm not sure about that. But anytime you have questions, um, you can ask me after, or s uh, feel free to send me an email, and we'll help you out. So we improved our search filters. Oftentimes, teachers will have a whole class of students say, OK, everybody, search my name or search the name of the binder and uh, start doing your assignment. So um, some teachers want to share, but these are all public, right? Um, so if you want to have your students search for a binder that's private, you can do that with the binder ID now. And so that's the, one of the later features. So every URL for a binder has a number attached at the end here. Here's an example of 187117 for the Common Core Standard Binder. If you go into our search tool and select binder ID and type in that number, even if it's private, it will display um, that binder. So for a private binder, if you set an access key, the students can type in the access key and it will open up the binder. If it's public, then it will just open up the binder automatically. You don't need a, an access key. And you can also do search with author. You can go for a specific name of a binder. You can try to find it by tags. You can also search shelves of binders. So I mentioned earlier that you could um, create your own custom shelf. So if you're looking for, let's say, people's math shelves, um, and there are quite a few out there. You, you can just type in math and make sure you select shelves and you'll see a whole list of shelves of binders that you can look at. Uh, sometimes I've done like third grade math, uh, high school chemistry, I've done searches for. Okay, and new feature on sign up. Uh, we have a number of students who are under 13 and don't have email accounts or are not um, we don't really want their email, so we provide a way for teachers to sign up their students. And what we do is a teacher um, will create a unique username for them, tie in their email address, and then whenever a student uh, is forgetting their password, that email address that gives them the new password will go to directly to the teacher. And that's really the only reason right now that we collect emails is when um, you forget a password, we can send it to you. So that's a new feature on sign up. So you can collaborate on a binder. I know I, I didn't mention it before, but uh, if you are working on a binder 
and you are doing a project with several students or you want your students to upload content into your binder, you just need, they need to have a Live Binders account, but you can invite them to be a collaborator. And one of the new features that we've added with that is if you are a subscriber, um, you and the person that you're inviting as a collaborator, the collaborator can actually upload a file to your account. So uh, many of our subscribers are, are um, getting private upload features, which is one of the features of being a, uh, getting a subscription with us. So um, it also provides you more storage. So say, for example, a teacher has a, an account with a larger amount of storage. Students um, are uploading content into her binder, but they're keeping it in their account. So that's one of the things about having live binders is when you upload content, it stays in your account. But if a teacher has more storage and she wants students to upload to her account so she has all of the homework assignments in her account to look at, then they can click on the upload to, um, in this example, it's John Smith's account, so the username's account. Um, and then you have the option to make that file private, which is, again, a subscription feature. So I mentioned earlier that you could color main tabs, and you saw a lot of examples of that. Well, brand new feature out, we can now color sub tabs, and that was an exciting feature that came out, I want to say, almost a month ago, a few weeks ago maybe. So now you can color sub tabs, and it's a great way to organize content um, by color coding. So uh, you can see how teachers might um, Want to, if you got, for example, if you've got a math tab and you want to make subtabs broken down into, you know, subtraction and addition, you could have content that's all addition be one color and subtraction be all another color, um, which again uh, is a way for teachers to kind of organize um, multiple hierarchies of tabs without having that third row, which, by the way, is coming in the future. I mentioned that already. But that's how teachers are working around it right now is just the way that they mark the, the sub-tabs um, has been a way that they've kind of organized it and the coloring of those sub-tabs helps that even further. So we're excited about that. So now you can upload multiple files at once into a binder. So we had some administrators who uh, wanted to convert all of their paper binders into virtual binders. And we're not talking one file at a time. They've got you know hundreds of files that they want to add, and they didn't want to have to do it one at a time. So we provided a way for them to select as all the files that they wanted and then um, upload them at once. And then they can pick the binder that they want to add it to. So if you've got 20 files that you know you want to add quickly to a binder, you select the binder using Add to Binder, and it will upload um, those, all those files either as a tab or as a sub-tab. And then once you get it in the binder, you can use the editing tool um, copy or move tab, and that will um, point you in how you can move the, the tabs left or right, or move a tab into a sub-tab position, or move a sub-tab into a tab position. So that's a, a very popular feature right now for us. I think that came out quite a, a little while ago, I would say, maybe six months ago. So we introduced a new iPhone app, and this was also a teacher's suggestion. He has students that are middle, middle schoolers who don't have Live Binders accounts. He's not expecting them to create any binders, but he does have all of his daily homework assignments and class material in his binders. And what the kids were doing, he noticed, is they all have smartphones, and, and what he would do is provide them with the QR code for the binder. I don't know if any of you noticed, but we do provide a way to create, generate a QR code for your binder. So the kids would scan that QR code using a third-party QR code reader and then save the binder under the history uh, tab of that QR code reader. So every day, all they had to do was go find the binder in their QR code reader and then open up the binder to the video assignment or the homework assignment that they had to work on. So he suggested, you know, it'd be great if we could have an iPhone app where the students didn't have to log in. They just needed to um, scan my code or search for my binder and then um, upload it and, and save it in history. So we created uh, an iPhone app like that. And so this is a, a screenshot of uh, what a list of binders would look like that you have viewed. Um, from a QR code, or uh, I believe you could do a search, yes, so you provide a search, too, off of our public um, search website. 
So we have a new feature coming out, version 1.1. It could be coming out, I want to say, in the next couple of weeks. We're almost done with testing. And that will actually let you log into your account. So now we've got a whole set of users now who are saying, oh, but I would love to see my own private binders in here. So you can either log in to your iPhone app or not log in. And you can have access to your own personal private binders, or you can just use it to find and use other people's binders. So uh, that's another feature that we're excited about. So we have um, an iPad app as well. And we're about to implement a version that's similar to the iPhone app. But for right now, the things that we had added was the ability to log into your Dropbox account and your Evernote account and add those files into your binder from your iPad and also to access your photo library on your iPad. So that's kind of a, a new feature that we added, uh, well, it's been about six months now. But what's exciting for our users is as they're building um, these assessment binders, these evidence of teaching binders, they're taking a lot of pictures. And so if they're already on your iPad, um, it's very easy now to just go ahead and connect to your photo library, um, resize the image. It's the only place where we provide a way for you to resize your images in a binder. So the iPad app is, is a great way to go and do that. All right, so I don't know if any of you um, have noticed, certainly um, many of our new users won't notice this, but we are changing the look and feel of our website. So I wanted to give you guys a heads up that the dashboard that you see over here on the left that has, you know, start a blank binder, start a blank shelf, uploads, all of that is going to start moving over here on the right under your username as we start to clean up uh, the way that the page is displayed. So that's um, another thing that's happening with our website. And there's many more features coming out as, as I kind of hinted at. So it's exciting times. Things are de definitely evolving and, and changing and we're getting just great feedback from our users. So anytime you guys have questions um, or if you know you want to do something that you don't see that can be done, please let us know because we really, really take that feedback seriously and want to make this as convenient and easy for you as possible. So I'm going to share with you a couple ways that people are sharing binders. I mentioned to you embedding shelves. Um, if you are a subscriber, you can actually email little binder icons to users from within um, your binder application. You can embed binder icons on your blog or your website. So I mentioned how embedding shelves, but you can also just embed one or two binders using our embed code for the binder icons. Um, this interface here just again points out different ways that you can share. This is a little bit, this is a, one of our older interfaces, but it's basically the same thing. You can share links to a binder. In fact, uh, I'm not sure if I've ever shared this with you before, but you can actually share a particular link to a tab. So let's say that you updated a tab and it's got your latest assignment and you want to send it to your students. You can actually send the link to this particular tab, say Unit 6, and so when they open that tab, that link, it will go automatically to that tab. So it's a great way for them to go directly to the page that you want them to go. Um, here, again, is inside the binder. You can actually make your binders private or public, and here are the different options. So I mentioned a little bit earlier about how a binder can be copyable or not copyable. So you may create a binder that um, has proprietary content, and so you don't want anyone to be copying that binder. So you can set that here. You can make it private copyable or private copy disabled. Um, or you can make a, uh, a public copyable or copy uh, disabled. So it can be public, but nobody's allowed to copy it. And then when you set a private binder, you can set an access key right here. And one of the cool things that you can do is you may have a binder that you share with different groups of people. So you can share more than one access key. So you can do, just to come up with something, you can do access key 1, comma, access key 2, access key 3. And then as the group, you know, when you're done having a group look at it, you can just remove that access key and that particular group um, won't be able to open that binder anymore. So it's a great way to share with different groups without having to reset the password for everybody. 
Okay, so adding a binder to a shelf. I, I told you about the librarian um, homework shelf that she created for her web page and how easy it was to add a binder to a shelf. So you know, there's no HTML involved. You don't have to um, worry about trying to create a web page. Once you embed the shelf, it's really easy to add a binder. And it, it's not just your binder. You can add other people's binders to a shelf. So you just click on either the options menu when you're looking at the binder icon on your My Binders page and say Add to Shelf. And then it will give you a menu option of all the shelves that you created. And you pick the shelf that you want. Or you click on that little plus icon I showed you earlier, and you select Add to Shelf. And um, it's just as easy to remove. You get into the shelf that, that um, on your My Binders page, and you just select the binder options menu, and you say Remove from Shelf. So it's pretty easy to add and remove binders from a shelf. Um, so we're going to have a, some. Looks like we're going to. I'm going to be showing you some example of binders. This is an example of a mini binder. So what a mini binder is, it's a, it's a binder that opens up on your blog page. And you can resize the binder. This is a blog page by one of the students. I have this example in your Classroom 2.0 live binders that Peggy has shared the link with you on. If you look for sample ePortfolios, you'll see my comment at the top. This student um, was in a pre-service class. And part of their requirement was to write a summary of their course work and all the technology that they learned for their um, teaching class. And so they did that in a blog. And then they were supposed to share a portfolio. And this particular student um, was clever enough to say, well, I'm just going to embed this open binder inside my blog. So as you're, you know, you know, I don't show you the whole blog post here, but just a couple of lines. But at the bottom of it, she embedded this binder. And so when you're reading the blog, you can actually click on the tabs to the binder and see her content, which was really a clever way to keep everything in one place. Um, and make her, her blog post actually dynamic because the binder already took care of that with the tabs and the subtabs. This is the homework shelf I was talking about. I'm glad this screenshot is in here. This is St. Joseph's Convent School. Um, you could probably search this on the web. Um, this may even be in the Classroom 2.0 binder. But you can, you'll see in here that she's got um, science, and mathematics. She's got the human body. This is my favorite binder. I, I always go to this one. Uh, I, she's got binders on art. And this is where the students go when they are ready to do their homework. And they know that all the resources that are in this binder are, are all they need to do, worry about when they're doing their homework. So it's, it's actually kind of a comfort zone for them when the students go home and are ready to do their homework. They know that where everything is and where they need to go to get it. So this binder is great. This is, I think, for third and fourth graders. And it's a web quest on um, the Arctic. So the teacher has put everything that they need to know and everywhere they need to go in a binder. So it's a safe way to explore the web. And I kind of like what Donna had said earlier about how she, wa you know, she wants the kids to feel free to explore, but she wants to be there while they're exploring. And, and um, that. That uh, comment really stuck to me. And I think this is a good example of that. The kids um, are going to go exploring the web, but it's in the safe place. So every link that they need to go to is in here. On the right, you can see where the teacher has added comments about what they need to do. So if they're lost about what they're supposed to be doing as they're looking at this video or this website, they just have to look at her comments on the right to know exactly what they need to do. So this, I think, is really great for the younger grades, but can also be very useful for the older students. This one, um, we talked about using them for computer labs. This is, uh, we did a webinar with, um, uh, um, I'm trying to remember her name now, but I can't remember it right now. Um, she's also a teacher, I think, in South Carolina. She experimented with live binders and did a paper roller coaster project for her students. And she put everything that they needed to know in this binder. You know, what are the rubrics? When are the due dates? What are the assignments? Here are all the videos. Here are the vocabularies. And you can see that she's got this tab here on labs. And so on certain times of the day, they'd go to the computer lab. And each computer station would have one of the sub-tabs um, 
opened up and ready to go on that computer. So the kids would move at their own pace between each of the labs working on assignments. Um, they could view the video over and over again if they didn't learn how to fold something correctly or uh, if they're learning about friction with this interactive website. Um, it would be on that tab um, at that station and if they needed to review it again, they could just take the binder with them home, right? They know where to find it on the teacher's website and review that tab again. So again, this is a great way when you've got a lot of information that you're sharing with the younger grade students, this is a great way for them to find that material again, even on their own time um, and, and get confident with the material that they're trying to learn. This project uh, was also an experiment for a teacher who teaches eighth grade and he wanted the students to start learning how to research on the web. So he was thinking, well, how would I use live binders for this purpose? So what he did was created a very um, detailed oriented template for the students. In each of those tabs, he tells them exactly what they need to do. And if you think about it, you know, in, in eighth grade, they don't know where to begin or even how to organize their material. But the spatial representation of each of these tabs, knowing where material is located, just he had them, he created this template and he had them copy it into their own account and then they filled in the material. So it may seem simple at first, but when you think about it, they're actually learning how to organize because the structure is already there. It, it, it was really an interesting project. We got to see some of the students' final work here and I believe these are all in um, the Classroom 2.0 binder and I've made comments to them so feel free to take a look at those. But this was a really great project. We had one of the students present to us, Danny Anderson here, um, what he found. So the teacher provided all the websites that they needed to go to to find material and what questions they were supposed to answer and fill that all into this binder and then they take that material and present their final project on it. And Donny, Danny had found some really cool CIA websites outside of what the teacher had recommended and shared some really cool material, some um, secret coding messages that were passed back and forth between the military were revealed on this site. So he got to share all of that with his students. So he was pretty, pretty excited about it. So remember those projects uh, where you had to learn about a country and you'd go down to the library and you'd go to the travel agency and you'd grab all these brochures? Well, now when we travel, we do everything online. So imagine doing that project now uh, where you can organize it online in a binder. So this has um, been an ongoing project with uh, this particular teacher. This is a student example here. I, I believe this is also in the Classroom 2.0 binder. But she's got her Expedia website in here. She's got web pages to the museums that she visited, to the restaurants that they visited. And in each of them, she can write her journal entries. So this is, um, you know, your, your uh, trip binder 2.0 version uh, for the students. So Michael Thornton um, introduced live binders to his third graders. He also introduced them to Google Forms. And putting two, the two together, the kids just went crazy and realized, hey, I could actually create my own test materials and my own tech book, textbooks using live binders. So the kids got really excited. These are third graders who started gathering their own material and learning the different cycles. Um, of life for his project and so they started putting binders together to share with each other as they were getting ready for testing on this material. So you, there are other binders that we put in the Classroom 2.0 binders that I comment on that show the material that they used to, to learn um, the water cycles and, and frog cycle. But then they also created Google Forms of tests that they could take or quizzes that they could take to prepare them for the final test for that class. So this binder represents what they put together. Uh, for that and I was just, um, this has been a couple of years now, but I was pretty blown away at that time. I didn't even know how to do a Google form and here these third graders were doing it and embedding them into a live binder. And by the way, there are two ways you can do it. One is with a link and then also the other way is with an embed code, which I had shown you how to do that earlier. Oh, this is a great binder. This is also in your Classroom 2.0 binder and I believe I did write uh, comments about this one. Uh, this is by Kansas State. 
Um, and it's for all the graduates who are about ready to enter the workforce and everything they need to know about um, how, to, how to conduct themselves in an interview for a job application is in here. There's videos on how to dress, um, how to write your cover letter, example cover letters are in here. So you can see how the students would be referring to this binder over and over again um, as they start writing resumes and as they start writing cover letters and getting ready for their first interviews. So this is a very popular binder and it's located on their website. We talked about ePortfolios. Um, this is uh, a teacher who, or a teacher who's assigned as the counselor for the senior project portfolio, and she used Live Binders as a template. So um, she created this with all the requirements for each of the different tabs, and the students would copy this binder and then fill in with all the material um, that they needed to complete their portfolio project. So I believe this is also in the Classroom 2.0 binder. Uh, and this is one of my favorite projects. This is actually a group collaboration project. It's a senior project for English. And they were given all kinds of different topics. This one is my favorite one that have to do with what's going on on campus. So some of it has to do with you know, senior parking situation, cafeteria food. This one has to do with gossip. And the teacher um, has given them clear instructions on what they need to do to, com to complete this project. You've got to do a survey. I want you to do interviews. Um, I want you to show me your, your results. Um, how are you going to plan this project out? All of this is laid out. And what was neat was that in the first tab here, she um, reserved this first tab for her page. And so you could see every week that she would upload her comments about the binder. So she clearly made them, she made them make her a collaborator so that she could um, add her comments to their binder. Um, this is also in the Classroom 2.0 binder. So if you go to it, you'll see the final grade that was given to these students and her final comments about it. But I like the way that the students had organized all of their um, Survey Monkey interview charts and surveys. Um, they conducted YouTube videos, so those video interviews are in sub tabs in the interview tab. It was just really nicely uh, organized for that project. So I'd love to share that one. OK, and there are many more in the Classroom 2.0 binder, so please feel free to take a look at them. I did make comments on all of them. Uh, because I, that's one of my favorite things to do is I, I love looking at all these great examples of binders and, and how teachers and students are using them. So please feel free at your own time. I'm, I think Peggy has already shared the link with you. And thank you. If you guys have any questions, I'm here. Or you can always send um, questions to support at livebinders.com. And Barbara and I or Dana will answer them um, almost immediately. So we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Donna and Peggy and Lori, and you guys have a great weekend.